Okay. <laughs> Hello, dear friends. Gugu evening. Such a beautiful, beautiful evening. I hope you can see this book. It's uh, The Mirror Stone by Michael Palin, Alan Lee, and Richard Seymour, the three authors. And uh, Alan Lee's painting is just fantastic, fantastic. The first time he saw it was, he, the first time he saw it was at the swimming pool. He dried his hair as usual, pulled out his Mickey Mouse comb, comb pulled out his Mickey Mouse comb, glanced in the mirror, and then started back in shock and then started back in shock for the face he saw looking back at him was not his it was not his face looking back at him so he was in shock it wasn't very different but something was wrong the hair was a bit longer, the cheeks were a bit thinner. Do I really look as bad as that? thought Paul, peering closer. And that's when he got an even bigger shock. For she, for as he moved nearer to the mirror, the other face stayed still. Paul felt himself go very cold for a moment. Then he heard a shout from one of the boys behind him. Stop staring at yourself. We all know you are ugly. When Paul looked at the mirror again, there, sure enough, was his own freakly, friendly face. Freckly, freckly, friendly face. Paul was the best swimmer in the school. He was especially brilliant at swimming underwater. He could swim three lengths of a pool without once come up for air. In fact, that day, Paul had spent such a lot of time underwater. He wondered if this was why he was seeing something. The next day, something very odd happened again. He was brushing his teeth when he became aware of a strange sensation, as if he were being watched. He looked up, and there was the face that wasn't quite his face staring back at him from the mirror. This time, it couldn't possible it couldn't possibly be him because Paul had a mouth full of water and the other face didn't. He smiled as best he could, but the face didn't smile back. Suddenly, 
The bathroom door flew open, and his mother rushed in, looking for her earrings. Are you all right? She asked. You look as though you were seeing a ghost. Paul shook his head. No, 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 I'm fine, he murdered. As soon as his mother had gone, he looked back into the mirror. There was nothing there except a schoolboy with a bulb of toothpaste, with a blob of toothpaste on the end of his chin. After school that day, Paul was walking home past the old TV repair shop when he stopped in amazement. It was always closed. It was always closed. And all the televisions inside were broken anyway. But today, something was different. One of the old television sets seemed to be on. He pressed his nose up against the window. What he saw made him suddenly stiffen. The television wasn't actually on at all. It was a reflection on the screen. He could see the car. He could see the cars passing in the road behind him, but where he should have been was the boy from the mirror. But where he should have been was the boy from the mirror. Paul jumped back, and for a moment he saw the face reflected on every dusty screen in the shop. He turned and ran. He dropped his school bag, caught his foot in it, and falling headlong onto the road, was nearly run over by a 24 bus. He screeched to a halt. It screeched to a halt. The car screeched, the bus screeched to a halt, and Paul picked himself up and walked on, trembling. <laughs> when Paul reached home, instead of throwing his bag, his bag at the cat and switching on the television, he threw himself at his mother and clung to her. You are old enough to know about crossing the road, Paul, honestly. Paul held on to her even harder. I saw something in the shop. Seeing things? Now come on. You are just shaken up and a good thing too. You will be more careful next time. You are just shaken up and a good thing too. You will be more careful next time. Paul decided to tell her everything about the faces, about the boy he kept seeing, but she was in a hurry as usual. I will be back in half an hour. Be good. A moment 
minute later, he heard the door. He heard the door slam. The apartment was very quiet. He sat down until he could feel his heart beating more slowly. His knee hurt. Looking down, he saw a long dark glaze. There was even a smear of blood. He went into the bathroom, switched on the light, and pulled open the door of the cardboard where the medicine were kept. He heard a noise. At first, he thought it was the squeak of the cardboard door. Then it came again. This time, there was no mistaking it. It was a voice, yet there was no one else in the house. It was coming from the direction of the mirror. Other voices joined in. Paul turned slowly towards the mirror and there was the boy. What do you want? cried Paul. The boy said nothing but stretched out his hand as if beckoning Paul to follow him. Where are you going to take me? asked Paul, trying to keep his voice from shaking. He followed the boy closer to the mirror. And as he did so, an icy breeze blew into the bathroom. Although it had no window and the sound of the voices grew, the bathroom he knew so well began to disappear. The light became brighter. The wind blow stronger, and the next moment Paul found himself blinking in the middle of a strange city. It was full of towers topped with flags which swirled in the breeze. He recognized Nothing and no one. It was like a picture in a history book. He looked behind him, but there was no sign of the bathroom. He looked ahead of him, but there was no sign of the boy.
the voice he had heard belonged to a crowd of people who had gathered and were st staring at something in the most unfriendly way. Then he realized that what they were staring at was him. He followed their eyes down to the tips of his white running shoes with the hole in the toe and up past the dirty old jeans to the faded go Ghostbusters t-shirt, which, yeah, Ghostbuster, which his mother was always trying to throw away. And he suddenly understood just why they were staring. They'd never seen anyone looking like him before, and they didn't seem to like it. Hey, you, a most evil-looking man, stepped forward and came up so close to Paul that he could see bits of cheese on the man's beard. You are coming with me. Paul realized that the only brave thing to do was to run away, and without knowing quite where he was going, where he was going, he raced across the square, through a fountain, scattered a flock of geese, a flock of geese, ducked under a balcony and disappeared down a narrow passage. He could hear shouts behind him. Getting closer and closer, he caught sight of some stairs leading to a lighted window high up above him and threw himself desperately towards them. The stairs seemed to go on forever, and he was breathing, bracing in great gasps, gasps, as he reached the top and squeezed himself into a darkened doorway. Then the door he was leaning against fell open, and he tumbled into a clattered, cobwebby room, in the middle of which sat, sat a very old man indeed. Ah, there you are. We've been waiting for you. Oh, I love this painting. I love, love, love this painting. Oh, I love this painting, absolutely.